You're listening to Last Word Radio, where you, you get the last word. Welcome to the Fourth Line Podcast in partnership with Last Word on Sports. This is September the 1st, 2017, and with you today is myself, Tiny Mike, and with me is the always wonderful Joel. Joel, how are you doing? I'm confused. Why are you here? Wait, what, what are you talking about? It's time for the fourth line. Do you, do, you, do you even know anything about hockey other than about the Sharks? Wait, wait, wait. There's hockey teams other than the Sharks now? <laughs> Where is Carl and what have you done with him? <laughs> That's right, Joel. We do not currently have the best mustache in hockey podcasting with us today. Let's consider this an extra special bonus edition of the fourth line. And boy, do we have some bonus for you. Uh, But before we get into any of that good stuff that we have in store, there's just something that's much, much more important for us to discuss. Uh, Joel, we we live in very different parts of this great continent of ours. But man, it's hot out here for the both of us right now. What's uh, what's the temperature like where you live? We are hitting around 30, 33, somewhere in there today. It was... It is a scorcher. And it's like, I know everyone's like, oh, it's super hot where I am. You know nothing. No, we do know. It is stinking hot and it's humid. I'm pretty sure the only place that has like a leg up on us is Florida. I hear that place is terrible in the summer. I have heard that it's terrible at all times of the year, so I can support you on that one. Uh, And I think you used the right word to describe the the, the weather. It's stinking hot. So it's 38 right now in San Francisco. And let me tell you, I stink. Uh, so whenever it gets hot, like, I get sweaty. I get smelly. I get very unpleasant to be around. You think Carl's the stinky one, but here on the fourth line, we all have the capacity to stink a little bit now and then. So, Joel, when we got days like this, I mean, it's damn near unbearable for me. How do you go about beating the heat? So today, this is what we did. We, I, My wife was working, so me... Me and my son, we went to, you know, like those, like, kiddie parks that have, like, the water shooting out of, like, rocks and stuff? We just went there and sat. We didn't even play. We just, like, (laughs) sat in the water. You didn't want to do anything. You just wanted to sit in the water. So that's what we did. So uh, so we did that. And then, obviously, there's only one other thing that you can do in this kind of heat. You got to put something cold inside of you, right? Exactly. Ice cream. We ate I was thinking cream. beer, but ice cream is also a fantastic idea. I think people frown upon giving children beer, at least in Canada. I was going to say we live in again. We live in very different parts of the world. <laughs> so I don't know. Do you do you remember? I, I was going to say. Do you remember in French class? You don't live in Canada. You didn't have French class. Man, it's close enough. But they used to like talk to us about how like you would. Like, people in France would drink wine out of cereal bowls for breakfast, and, like, it would be their kids, too. I don't know. Seems bizarre. But, anyways, that's not what we... We're... I want to talk about ice cream. Because I I was... Obviously, I was just, like, picking my ice cream today. There's always, like, one go-to for me. But... Or probably maybe even, like, two or three. But, like, is there... Is there a go-to for you? Like, is there a top, like one or two like basically because everyone loves power rankings i'm essentially asking your ice cream power rankings right now but we're only gonna do like three because this isn't actually what we were supposed to be talking about so carl's probably all like carl's already like pulling his hair out because out of his mustache because he's like these guys are derailing and it's not even two minutes in but we're going there so so this is not what we're supposed to talk about, but it's probably the most important conversation that either one of us is going to have this week. Uh, and I agree with you. A hot day, you need something cold to cool you down starting from the inside out. Uh, I go ice cream also, and I definitely have uh, one or two favorites. I mean, I'm a fat guy, so I've got like 10 favorites. But like for the purpose of this conversation, we can definitely count on one or two favorites. Uh, I will say this. One of my grinning principles is that I do not like ice cream flavors that try too hard to replicate a naturally occurring flavor. So, for Ooh. instance, strawberry ice cream, not on my list. Interesting. Strawberry ice cream is fantastic, but I don't want that for my ice cream. Uh, so I'm going to go with my number two first. Cookies and cream is my second favorite ice cream. Oh, okay. You say, do you have a third or no? Or are we just doing top two? Oh, I can go third. If we're, if, we're, if we're going third, I will, I will definitely go with a nice rocky road. 
Yeah. It's actually something I hated as a kid. I didn't like nuts in my ice cream at all, but as I've gotten older, I've gotten wiser, and I've gotten fatter. And, uh, and Rocky Road now has a prominent place in my, in my ice cream power rankings. I love the marshmallow. I love the chocolate flavor. I love the nuts. So I think it all comes together into a really good package for a number three ice cream right there. For me, I just this is like my third favorite ice cream, and I only had it for the first time last week. So it's like it made a quick jump. Uh, it's, a, it's a new Ben & Jerry's flavor. Peanut butter with Oreos. Ooh. So it's like peanut butter swirl chunks with like full size Oreos. Full size? Yeah, like there was full size, like there was like at least two full size and then like a bunch of like broken up bits of Oreos, but there was for sure two full size Oreos. Oh, they don't call them Oreos. It's like peanut butter and cookie or something like that. But don't get me wrong. They are Oreos inside <laughs> that bad boy. Uh, so that's my that's my third. My number two and I know, like, my number two is a love it or hate it. I know it's a love it or hate it. Like, people either love this flavor or hate it. And so, uh, but I'm not ashamed about it. Mint chip. Ooh, that is a very polarizing, uh, very polarizing option. I happen to fall on the love it side. Okay, But good. I know many people who, uh, who, who swear that it's, it's, a, it's a work of the devil and refuse to eat it. I don't get that, man. It's so good. I don't get it either. I mean, it's right up there with, with people thinking cilantro tastes like soap sometimes. It's just something that I do not understand. That's disgusting. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> All right. What's your number one, your go-to? Go-to, and this comes in many different iterations, but this is always thematically what I choose if I'm going for my top choice. Cookie dough ice cream. Oh, that's a, that's a good choice. Love cookie dough. I mean... I think we may have discussed in other forums that I'm a little bit of a milk addict and I drink way too much milk for any human body to process. True story. Uh, but cookie dough ice cream is basically just cookies and milk in ice cream form. It's the best of all possible worlds. I love it so much. Do you buy, like, the tubes of Pillsbury cookie dough and just eat it out of the tube while you're watching? Like, that's your snack when you go to the movies? So that's like my snack when Zoe's out of town for a week, and so we, we call it sweatpants week. So yeah. during sweatpants week, that is definitely one of my go-to moves. Uh, you just cut open cut open the top of the wrapper and just eat it like a Slim Jim uh, until there is nothing left of either the cookie dough or your self-respect. Yeah, you're just unashamed right now. There's no shame with Tiny Mike. My, my number one, you're going to hate my number one after already revealing what you go against. Uh, strawberry ice cream. I oh, no! Like, yeah, strawberry is my go-to. And, like, not not even, like, a fancy strawberry. Like, the most generic, like, no-name brand in the big tub. Just super artificial strawberry. I just love it for some reason. I don't even know why. That's, like, so. But that's, like... That's like if I'm at home and having ice cream. I probably will never, like, I'll probably, like, if I'm out, I wouldn't get strawberry. But I don't know why. It's like, it's one of those, see, I do feel shame at being my number one. <laughs> like, because I know that's like, that's the one flavor of Neapolitan that nobody likes. And I'm like, yeah, give me that stuff. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, yeah, so that, well, there you go. A hot day. Everyone has likes ice cream, so... If you don't like ice cream, don't listen to this show. I feel very comfortable with that. We will fight as a listener if you do not like ice cream. <laughs> so uh, I do have one of the – this is what, what we were wanting to talk about. And I know, like, we're already, like, late in the game for this, especially for when this gets released because I have no idea when this is actually coming out. We might actually be in the middle – or like a tag on of the act of the actual show this week. This might be a mid mid week release. I don't really know what's happening. So whenever you're listening to this, regardless, we are well beyond the fight of the century, right? That's what is that? What it was tabbed? I mean, it, it was it was definitely tabbed the fight of the century. Which which I mean, it could have been a fight of a century. Like maybe 300 years from now, there's not going to be any more fights, and this one will be the fight of that century. But I think I'm leading, uh, leading a little bit too much with, with my opinions here. Joel, so we both watched that Conor McGregor-Floyd Mayweather fight this past weekend, one week ago uh, on, on Friday of last week. 
uh, I think we came came to it uh, in in two different ways. I think we were both to varying degrees trying to avoid the fight for a little bit, right? Yeah, I got suckered into watching it. I basically like all all the guys on my ball team decided that they were one of the guys was going to order it. We were all going to go over and watch it, and I got told I was coming. I basically had the same exact experience, but I was, I ended up being the person from your ball team. Not literally, but like that's the role I played. I was the guy who ended up having to order the, order the fight and had a bunch of people come over and watch. So, uh, so yeah, I think we both were trying to avoid it because neither one of us really wanted to spend money to, to, to watch this fight. But we both watched it. We both did spend some sort of money to a varying degree for this. So let me ask you, Joel, did you get your money's worth out of that fight? I got more. I I thought it was better than Pacquiao Mayweather, right? Did you did you see that one? Absolutely, I do. I do end up catching most big fights on paper. Okay, so, so I I thought it was I I wasn't disappointed. I actually and I but see, and the thing is, is the reason why I wasn't disappointed was I didn't think McGregor would last more than two rounds, and so like every round after that, I was like, oh, I'm getting like more money than like more value than what I thought I was going to get. And I like, not only did he last rounds, he actually won rounds, which is crazy. And well, actually what I thought was actually the the craziest thing is I think he won, he won more rounds than what the judges gave him. Like I thought there's no doubt Mayweather won the fight, but McGregor, I thought won more rounds than what, than what the judges gave him. Yeah, I agree with you there. I mean, especially early on, it seemed like Floyd had a strategy of trying to tire uh, McGregor out, letting McGregor uh, exercise a lot of energy, throw a lot of punches. Uh, and, you know, that came with the result of McGregor landed way more punches in the early, I think, four rounds than, than Mayweather did. And sure, from that fourth round on, Mayweather turned up the intensity a little bit, turned up the activity to, to continue tiring uh, Conor McGregor out. Uh, but in the early going, Conor was landing more punches than, than Mayweather was. He looked much more aggressive. Uh, and the only thing I can think of is judges may have decided to reward Mayweather since they may have been able to see that this could have been following one of his main strategies. I don't know, Joel. What do you think about that? I don't know. I, I, I can't really talk about I hate Mayweather. Like, I hate Mayweather. So, so there would have been – and I also hate UFC. So this was just like a no-win situation for me. But there would have been nothing more I would have liked to see – then McGregor just beat him up. Like, I just, that would have been a great experience. But this is the one thing, and as you're, as everyone's listening to this, they're like, why are you guys talking about boxing on a hockey podcast? Well, here's where, this is, this is what got this conversation going. I was trying to think, is there a way, like, so, I, so in hockey, I was trying to think of an equivalent. If we were to see a fight in hockey that was, the Mayweather McGregor. What Ooh. what would that look like, and who like what players would that be? Because like I was trying to think, because like it's such a it was such a weird the fight was such a weird thing to begin with. Watching Conor McGregor like box, I I've grown up watching boxing. Like one of my um, friends' dad was always like talk, talking to us about boxing and sh- watching fights, and so I kind of grew up around it. I've never seen anyone box like Conor McGregor before. Like it was so awkward to watch. And so I was trying to think, so I was trying to think of like, what would it look like in hockey to have kind of like a world-class hockey fighter get challenged by someone who doesn't know anything. Well, I guess doesn't know anything, but doesn't really know anything about fighting and then kind of hold his own for a little bit. I was trying to think of like what well, like what players. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but I'm gonna I'll bring some suggestions, um, in a, in a couple minutes here. Okay. So I definitely was thinking about this a little little bit also, and excuse me for the dated references, but I kept on imagining somebody along the lines of an of an Evgeny Malkin, uh, who uh, who is definitely not your born and bred fighter. No goon is he. Uh, thinking of, of him going against somebody like. Sorry for 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 the for the the dark history, but a Todd Bertuzzi, Ooh. you know, so, yeah, so, so, someone who who definitely takes a little pleasure and has a lot of experience around throwing some dirty shots and hurt and hurting folks. 
trying to tee off against one of the speedsters out there. That's that's immediately what I thought of. Even though the physical profiles don't match up, the level of experience is exactly what I was thinking of. Man, you are really pointing out that Carl is not here right now. <laughs> because uh, we, I don't know... I don't know if we're allowed to bring up Bertuzzi on this podcast or not. It's it gets dark very quickly when he's brought up. See, but here's the thing, and this is Carl would be very quick. We need Carl. Carl, where are you? We miss you, Carl. Uh, I don't know if Bertuzzi actually fought that much. He had like he had a, he definitely has a dirty streak to him, or not even a streak. He has a dirty moment for sure. But I don't know if he like really had that much like fighting experience and i was trying to think of who who would be someone that maybe has that fighting experience but then uh would take on a guy that's maybe not so much and like the one thing that i the one guy that i kind of like always thought about like uh do you how much do you know about jerome mcginla not enough apparently not enough. So please tell me more he would have no problem throwing it down every now and then and fighting with fighting with someone. But, like, it just kind of always felt out of place when he was fighting. Because, like, you're not used to the best player on the team, your top goal, goal scorer, the guy that's, like, he's not known for fighting. But then he, was, he wasn't afraid to back down from anyone. And that was kind of, so it was like... It, but not in the same way that McGregor was not afraid. Like, McGregor was just super cocky, right? But, like, Jerome Ginla was not like that at all, but yet wasn't afraid to back down from a fight at all. Um, so, like, I thought I was like, that's kind of the guy. But, uh, and this one, I, I don't think you'll know this guy. Like, I, I, I'm, this is, I'm really testing your hockey knowledge right now, but have you ever heard the name Darcy Tucker? I have the name Darcy Tucker. See, I know nothing about him, but I've heard the name. That guy reminds me of Conor McGregor. Just like the, his attitude is way bigger than he is. And so, uh, and so just like he would take, and again, he would kind of take on anyone and would be happy to challenge anyone. Although everyone who is his opponent would argue that he was not willing to take on anybody. Um, but but I I don't I don't mind like the Eugeni Melkin I like that I like that selection selection because like he would be he would be the Conor McGregor in this comparison but that's a good one because like Malkin's like he's kind of like the guy that like in like a tussle would be the one like yeah like go ahead and hit me I'm better than you I'm gonna score anyways like it just kind of but like he's big and he's physical I don't that's a good I think that's a good selection. Thank you. I'm glad I didn't completely embarrass myself. Uh, but it brings up an interesting question. So, you know, we saw what we saw, and I think all criticisms of the fight and Connor's performance are pretty fair. Uh, but, you know, here's a question I have. Do you think this is the last time we'll see one of these crossover-type matches of someone from a different sport fighting uh, fighting in a, in a professional ring? Well, I did hear that Michael Phelps challenged Connor McGregor to a swimming race. So... Uh, I I don't you, you got to think that a UFC the UFC guy is gonna come like transit go to boxing again like I think that's that's no surprise like I I would be interested to see if we ever see a guy from the NBA or a guy from the NFL go between like because like you always hear about like was it like Julius Peppers and. Um, Antonio Gates and like these like former basketball guys in college now playing tight end. Well, what if what if like because we did, we don't have the the two sport athlete anymore. But you got to think that's going to happen again sometime where a guy is good enough to be in the NBA and the NFL because he's just like an elite athlete goes to one two doesn't really succeed and tries to flip. Like I guess we have. Mr. Tebow, but that's not quite going as well as I think he was hoping it would go. Absolutely not. I don't think it's going well at all, or at least not as well as he would like, sort of like he said. Uh, but you bring up an interesting point. Uh, so we have all these athletes from, from different walks of life. And for instance, we have seen an NFL player in Johnny Morton have a single UFC match, and he got knocked out within 90 seconds. 
So that might have been the right, that might not have been the right fit for him. But I think it's worth thinking of like, how are some of these fights being conducted in other sports? And how transferable would some of those fighting skills that we've seen transfer into the world of MMA or professional boxing? So, uh, so Joel, I mean, what's some of like the big fights that you can think of that stand out from some of the other major sports? Well, there's the, like, there's the, the malice in the palace. Like, that's the one that I think of like immediately when you think of fighting in sports. Right. But and like, and it's and and maybe other sports other than hockey you can think of the fights immediately because hockey's the only sport that fighting's allowed. Absolutely, yeah. So it's sort of fades in the background of the rest of uh, the rest of hockey culture, the rest of the game that we watch. Uh, we don't see as much of that. But you know, in some of these other sports, like I'm th- I'm thinking of you know Major League Baseball, the great Nolan Ryan. He hit Robin Ventura with the pitch. Ventura took exception, decided to charge the mound as some young hot stud r- rushing this old man. Uh, Nolan having none of that. He let Robin Ventura get up to him. He got him in a headlock and started brutally knuckling him on top of the head. Probably landed about a good 15, 16 punches to the top of the head, the forehead, and the eyes. And uh, you see Robbie Ventura walking uh, walking back to the dugout, a defeated and bloody pulp about his face. Uh, Nolan Ryan had that old man strength. So I would love to see some sort of world where he gets to exercise that with regularity. I mean, obviously not in his current age, but transport Nolan Ryan from back in the day into the boxing ring, 102 mile per hour fastball. I'm pretty sure his right cross would knock me clean out of the ring. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, like I think, like I also, like I wonder, it's interesting, like if you look, if you go and like search like online about fighters, that, like it's all hockey. When it, if, it, if it's not boxing or UFC or some sort of fighting sport, the only thing that you find is like, is hockey so like which one so that that would be the natural like tie like is like you don't have lists of the top 20 greatest fighters from mlb history that's not real like that's not a thing or like you don't have that and you don't have that from the nfl because as soon as a guy throws a punch in the nfl he's ejected from the game and it's over and it's just like okay well that was not fight and but yet in hockey and, and like this is something that carl and i have talked about frequently it's celebrated in hockey it's kind of dumb that it's celebrated in hockey because that's not the point of the game is we celebrate it and it doesn't really it's it's this confusing thing but like there's got to have been guys over that were good fighters in the nhl and probably could have like held their own in a boxing ring like if they had gotten the appropriate training and stuff like that but they seem to hold their own i the only thing is, I remember, like, if you have, like, a minute-long fight in a hockey game on skates, like, you're dead tired. That's, like, that is an incredible amount of time. It's like a full shift. Yeah, but, like, but you're also, like, you're throwing punches, like, it's just, and you're trying to not get hit, and it's it's more work than a full shift. Like, you are, you're done after that for a good amount of time. Uh, I remember, I think, I think it was Bob Probert, like long. He's a well-known fighter and of hockey old times, and and he like I remember a couple watching some of his fights, and like they were long fight. Um, but yeah, can you what like so other than so like other than Ron Artest or is he Ron Artest again or is he? He is still Meta World Peace. <laughs> so Meta World Peace. Do you remember that night? Like, do you remember, like, I remember that night, like, vividly, because, because yes. it was just unheard of that, a, that there was a fight on the, on the court, and then players going into the stands fighting fans. Yeah, I was actually watching live, I honestly thought that maybe I passed out and was experiencing some sort of fever dream, because, like, you really could not believe what you saw happening. So, Ron Artest and Ben Wall, so it was the Indianapolis Pacers uh, playing against the Detroit Pistons at the Palace in Auburn Hills, Detroit's home court. And Ron Artest from, from the Pacers and Ben Wallace from, from the, the Pistons got into it. And Ben Wallace ends up pushing Ron Artest. There's a huge fracas. And Ron Artest actually removes himself from the scrum and goes and lies down on the scorer's table, which is something else that you just don't see in normal games. Somebody from the crowd threw a full cup of beer from where he stands onto Ron Artest. And that is when the crazy happened. Ron Artest stands up, looks back into the crowd, and the guy who actually threw the beer is pointing at somebody in front of him. Ron Artest goes up into the crowd, joined by his teammate Steven Jackson. 
finish his action to make him throw the first punch, grabs the wrong fan by the collar of the shirt, and starts sawing logs on his face. That's when all hell breaks loose. I mean, players from both teams then are starting to scramble, fighting each other, fighting fans. There's a great, uh, I shouldn't say great, there's a very memorable shot of Jermaine O'Neal taking a full running right cross swing at, a, at somebody who looked like they were about five foot six running onto the court, uh, looking to cause some sort of trouble. We've never seen anything like this. This, I mean, depending on who you talk to, it's either one of the greatest spectacles or one of the greatest aims uh, in modern NBA history. But Joel, that is one of the craziest things we've seen. Yeah. Oh, it's got to be one of the biggest stains. It's not like as much as it was memorable. Like it was. It was not something that anybody in the NBA world wanted. Like, it just, it got out of hand so quickly. Like, and Artest and Steven Jackson, didn't they get, like, they got, like, massive suspensions. Like, I think, like, one of them was, like, 50 games or something. Like, it was That was, that was Ron huge. who had one of the largest suspensions in NBA history on the trails of that fight. Good reason. So, but... The one thing though, like when it like when you think about like hockey compared to boxing, you don't have there's never a staged fight in hockey where someone it like there's like like behind the scenes someone is paying someone off to make sure something happens during the fight. Do you think so like going back to Mayweather or McGregor, do you think UFC Dana is it Dana White is that the guy's name? Yeah. Did did he pay off to say don't let McGregor hit the ground, like call call it off before he hits before he hits the ground. So I I think that there could have been there there's a possibility there's a chance that that happened. Uh, there's just a lot of very strange behavior from the referee throughout the entire fight. So for anybody who watched. Uh, you know, we saw Floyd May- Mayweather turn his back and duck his head to Conor McGregor five or six times at least throughout the fight. Um, Conor always seemed to wrap him up and almost put him through a suplex, and then he would always give him a quick punch on the back of the head, which you're allowed to do in UFC, but not in boxing. And after a certain point, the referee is supposed to start docking points from Conor McGregor's score so that you, know, you can discourage him from breaking the rules on a continuing basis. That never happened. He was allowed to do that time after time after time, and you have to wonder... Why didn't that referee step in and try to more strictly enforce the rules here? You know, what interest could that referee have had in letting the fight go on without, without, without removing points or without, you know, telling someone that they're going to be kicked out of the fight? Why did that happen? Uh, so I, I definitely think there's some room there. Um, but I think another consideration is there was a past fight of a USC fighter in a boxing match. Uh, and unfortunately, that USC fighter passed away after the match uh, due to what they considered repeated sub-concussive blows to the head. So I guess in UFC, using thinner gloves, the actual impact of the punch hurts more, but it does less damage to your brain. In boxing, the, the force of the punch hurts less, but it still knocks your brain around against the inside of your skull. So it's supposed to be much, much worse for you in the long term. Now, I'm, I'm not going to draw any direct lines between any one punch that was thrown during that fight and that fighter dying, but I think that really also had to be top of mind for boxing officials in general not wanting to see something similar happen in this match. Yeah, like, it was weird. I've never seen, I've watched a lot of boxing matches. I've never seen a guy turn his back on a on a fighter. Like, that was, it was bizarre. And not only, like, turn his back, but, like, one of the greatest boxers ever. Yeah, Floyd Webb does not make mistakes in the ring. Yes. He does not make mistakes in himself. He does not put himself in a position to get hit. He did it many times. Yeah, it was so it was bizarre. So like, I don't know. I'm, I'm not convinced that there was anything shady. I did wonder if like, Dana, because like there's so much money in UFC. I wondered if Dana White had paid off Mayweather to to throw the match to put UFC even more on the map. Because like, if McGregor had won that fight, that would have been the end of boxing. I'm pretty sure. Like, I just I can't imagine coming back from something like that. Where a guy who's never boxed before in his life comes in and beats one of the greatest boxers of all time. Like, that would have ended boxing. So I was like... Ruin the credibility of anybody else who'd ever stepped in the ring before that. Yeah, and so then if UFC could get their name behind that, then they would be then the next biggest thing. And it wouldn't even be close. So, But this... 
this god is us talking this week because this is this is this is obviously a conspiracy theory and this god is talking about conspiracies and so i wanted to talk about that a little bit not necessarily sports conspiracies but that's probably where we're going to spend most of our time because let's be honest those are the most interesting ones and probably the ones that are closest to our hearts and minds but is there a favorite conspiracy that you that whether you believe it or not someone believes it that's talked about is there a, is there a favorite one of you out there yeah yeah and this one is going to stick to sports and if we're just going like favorite like the story i enjoy the most uh it's a story involving cal ripken actually so i uh you know i was i was a big Giants fan growing up but for some reason cal ripken's uh streak of consecutively played games was something i really really admired you know, I, I, I grew up in a very working-class family, so I really appreciate someone who showed up to work every day, day in and day out, that you can rely on. Uh, but there was one game when I was younger that actually got postponed, an Orioles game that got postponed due to some sort of strange power outage. And there is a, there is a lingering thought that, did they postpone that game so that Cal Ripken, who was a little bit late to the stadium, could actually get there in time? Now, that's an interesting thought. But what's even more interesting is, wait, Cal Ripken is like, he's a workhorse. Why the heck was he ever going to be late to one of his own baseball games? He's a professional. Well, the story goes, Cal Ripken was going to leave for the, leave for the stadium, for his home, got just a little bit out, out of the way, turned back around to go back to the house, and whose car did he see in his driveway but Kevin Costner's? Sounds strange, but apparently Kevin Costner had some sort of contact with Cal Ripken's wife, and they decided to have themselves a little fun time while Cal was headed to the baseball game. Well, the story, the rumor, the conspiracy is that Cal Ripken found Kevin Costner in his house and spent about half an hour beating him up and down the stairs all over the backyard and just, you know, and just taking, taking, uh, and taking it to him to such a degree that he forgot that he had to get to the game. So once he was done beating Kevin Costner's butt, he got back in the car and started heading to the game, and people said, oh, my God, we know Cal's on his way here, but he's not here yet. What can we do? So we pull the plug on the, on the stadium power. We've got to postpone the game for an hour or two. Cal Ripken shows back up, participates in the game, keeps that streak alive, and his legacy is intact. Do you believe it? No, I do not for a second. But it's still one of my favorite conspiracy stories to tell and to think about. It's it's hilarious. That, I've heard that one before, and it's just, it just kills me that, like, Kevin Costner. Not only is it Kevin Costner, but like, like Kevin Costner has basically made his career being a baseball player on the screen, and so, so just the fact that he's involved with a baseball player in a story, like, it's just hilarious. Um, my favorite one, and I, I will say up front, I 100% believe this one, that Michael Jordan's break from the NBA to go play baseball was because was a was a worked out deal between him, the NBA, and the PA because of his gambling, and they told him to leave. Otherwise they'd suspend him. Um, I I absolutely believe this Joe. I believe this one to like the depth of my core. Why yeah. else would the greatest player leave at the at the peak of his like why would you do that there, there's no reason to i mean he was literally one of the best athletes in their given sport ever ever in the history of mankind and he just decided like you said just decides to leave at the peak of his powers for an entire year doesn't make any sense none at all that's the that's the one okay well we're gonna do we're gonna do a little little lightning round, so we won't talk so much about these ones. But we're gonna do what we can if we want. But uh, moon landing, yes or no? Sorry, just to clarify, yes meaning we believe the conspiracy, and no, we don't believe the conspiracy. Um, sure, yeah, we'll go with that. I do not believe the moon landing conspiracy. I think it actually did happen, no matter how much I like thinking of the other way. Do you believe the moon exists? <sighs> Tough question, but yes. <laughs> Did you, there are people. I was as I was researching moon landing conspiracies this afternoon. There are people out there that believe not only is the moon landing a conspiracy, 
The whole moon is a conspiracy. No! There are people that believe this stuff. They believe <laughs> the, not exist. That the moon just doesn't exist. I don't even get it. Like, how do you... It's in, it's in the sky. Like, the question... Like, we just had an eclipse recently. Ah. You probably had a better view of it where you were than where I am. Um, you might think so, but I had a view of the fog. It oh, was right. unfortunate for eclipse viewing. But, uh, like, wouldn't that be enough proof? You would think so. But... You would think so. But this is the same calendar year in which we've heard several star athletes say that they believe that the Earth is flat. <laughs> I have no follow-up to that. I mean, that's I just think... a real thing that's happened. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess this is... I guess this one's true, but... Um, the Chicago Black Sox incident. I think that's been confirmed, right? Confirmed. Fully confirmed. They were, they had eight players from that 1920 Black Sox team banned for life. But do you believe that Shoeless Joe Jackson threw games? I mean, he had to buy some new shoes. Do you, see, I believe that it happened, but I don't believe Shoeless Joe Jackson did. I think it would be hard to throw games the way the Black Sox tried to if Shoeless Joe Jackson was not a part of it. I don't know. I've seen Field of Dreams. <laughs> Again, bringing it back to Kevin yeah, Cox, exactly. I very much respect your callbacks. <laughs> uh, I've got a question for you. Okay, yeah. So this is a conspiracy that I think you're going to have a lot of opinions on. The 2005 NHL draft with Sidney Crosby. Oh. What? I believe that 100% that the NHL fixed that. First off, Gary Bettman. Don't even get me started about Gary Bettman. Worst ever. Second off, if the Pittsburgh Penguins don't get Sidney Crosby, the Pittsburgh Penguins then become the Kansas City Penguins. So, because they were about to lose their team. And the the city that was most likely going to swoop in and take them on was Kansas City. What kind of league would this be if there were the Kansas City Penguins and no Pittsburgh Penguins? Exactly. Exactly. Just the history. like So, not an original six team, but there's a lot of history with the Penguins. One of the greatest play like they've had they've had three of the greatest players now of all time on their team, and so and they've had lots of great players, but they have like a solid history there, and having them lo- like lose a team like that, like yeah okay we lost the Atlanta Thrashers and nobody cares there's no history like there's it's not a, it wasn't a hockey city it wasn't like there there wasn't anything there saying like no like it can work there, but they they were just so bad but. Yeah, absolutely. That they, the NHL fixing that draft. I hope that passed Gary Bettman at all to to make sure Sidney Crosby ends up saving that franchise. And now, like you wouldn't even like, it's unheard. Like you don't even think of it. Think of the fact that twelve years ago, the Penguins could have lost their franchise. Like it's not even like a question right now. So I am I'm a hundred percent in that. I and and not only that, I believe all leagues fix the drafts. Like I wouldn't like as a Leafs fan, the Leafs the Leafs managed to get Austin Matthews. I the NHL does better having Toronto be good. It's just it's just a fact. You can disagree with me all you want, you Detroit and whatever fans, but the fact of the matter is having the most important Canadian team I said it, I won't take it back, be good is important to the NHL. Just like it's important for a team like Pittsburgh to be good. They want those big markets. They want those big markets to be good. You don't want to go... I don't know, like, the actual size of between Pittsburgh and Kansas City, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Pittsburgh is a bigger market than Kansas City. And you probably want a team there as opposed to... Um, but don't don't you... Th- like, do you buy into 
leagues fixing drafts? One million percent. So the people that sit at the top of these leagues, the Gary Bettons, the Adam Silvers, uh, the Roger Goodells, may he not have his job too much longer, those types of individuals, I mean, they're looking out for multi-billion dollar corporations in effect. So if they have a need to broaden and expand the appeal of their league by, by pairing a very good upcoming young player with a franchise that's going to use them well and get great exposure out of it, I wouldn't put it beyond them in a heartbeat. There's billions of dollars at stake with these with the, with like this role. Is that something that any you know real leader of that kind of organization? Is that something that any of those guys are going to leave up to absolute chance? The, I mean, they should. Yeah. But thank you? thank goodness Goodell can't fix the NFL draft because like there's not really a way to fix it. The only way to fix it is if there was a tie, but I don't think like that's that's pretty few and far between when there's a tie, and so. Yeah. But thank goodness that he can't. Like, there's no lottery system. Can you imagine a lottery system in the NFL? It would be awful. No one would trust any result ever. Exactly. Like, well, you just said, like, I wouldn't trust Goodell to, to not fix the draft. I wouldn't trust Goodell to fix anything football-related. He All he seems to do is break things further. So, what would your take on... So you, this is in your this is your this is your main sport the 2002 NBA playoffs. Uh, so this this one uh, I shouldn't say it hits close to home because I wasn't rooting for either team, but it was the 2002 NBA playoffs, the Western Conference Finals that featured two teams from California that I knew very well at the time: the Los Angeles Lakers and the Sacramento Kings. Uh, I I don't even consider this conspiracy. I consider this an accepted fact that NBA referee Tim Donahue was placing money on games and colluding with his fellow referees to not influence wins and losses necessarily, but heavily influencing the point spread by gifting one team or the other an obscene amount of free throws with absolutely nothing given to the other team. So anybody who watched these games can see just how incredible it was called. I mean, I'm, sh- I'm sure this happens to some extent in hockey where one team is allowed to be much more physical than, than the other. Maybe the refs turn a blind eye to a slashing penalty for, for one team versus the other. Uh, but I'd never seen anything like what was happening in the NBA that summer. Uh, you know, the the Kings were the underdogs and the much less popular team than the Los Angeles Lakers. But they were ahead and looking like they were going to close up the series and win uh, when the referee stepped in. And I cannot remember the, the disparity in free throws, but I think it might have been something like 27 to 3 or something like that. It was some absolutely absurd number where you can see that the refs, little by little, were gifting the Lakers points, gifting them momentum gifting them foul calls against the most important players in the other team so they couldn't be on the floor anymore. Uh, I have never seen a game in any sport influenced as heavily as those referees influenced those 2002 NBA playoffs. Yeah, it's just... I never, like, I never, I wasn't watching when was it, but, like, you look back and, like, watching just the, like, um, whether a documentary or just, like, the articles about it and stuff like that, it's so hard. Like, that's... And... Tim Donnie, he's come out and said that he bet on games, right? Like, like that's a confirmed. Yes. So, so it's just, it's just crazy. Now, what about many people have lots of thoughts about this, and see, and see, for me, this isn't even a conspiracy. This is just like confirmed fact. But Deflate Gate, Spy Gate, those are just fact. That's not conspiracy, right? Let's just call it Belichick Gate, and and yeah, I mean, all, all of these have been confirmed. Now you can argue the silliness of Deflate Gate all you want, but there is no there is no denying the hard numbers behind uh, behind the fact that the balls were absolutely deflated. There is no lying that they, that they actually got in trouble and received penalties for recording their their opponents' practices. Uh, so I mean, I, I consider these known facts. We probably shouldn't even be talking about it as a conspiracy. We should probably just be talking about it as another reason to dislike the New England Patriots. That's the main reason, next to Tom Brady. What about, like, how do you feel about teams tanking? Like, does that oh. fall in conspiracy, or is that just gamesmanship, or is that just common sense, or is that, like, because, like, there's two ways that teams can tank. There's one that you just, you sell all your good assets, and just, you're so bad, so you're trying to win, but you're just so not talented that you just never win. But then there is the tanking where you don't want to sell off all your good assets, and so you just tell those good assets to be bad. So 
this is a, this is a very sensitive subject for me because one of my favorite teams, the Golden State Warriors, is one of the worst perpetrators of tanking in recent sporting memory. Um, so the Warriors are enjoying a lot of success right now. Uh, part of that success is due to the fact that several years ago they had a couple uh, great NBA draft where they had good good draft position and drafted great players in those slots. The most notable draft was the one in which they picked up Harrison Barnes, Draymond Green, and Festus Azili all in, all in a single draft. Well, that year, they ended up sitting both Steph Curry and David Lee up for obscene amounts of time with basically injuries. David Lee had a mysterious groin injury that nobody can point back to any game where he tweaked his groin or saw him limping or walking gingerly or anything like that. But all of a sudden, he was sitting out for the last three weeks of the year. You know, Steph Curry back then had ankle injuries. So that, that was a legitimate concern. But again, we saw him sitting out of games when he didn't necessarily look like he tweaked his ankle or was at risk to do anything bad. Uh, yet still, the Warriors were sitting their absolute best players, and they lost all of their final games to, to, to end the season and lost just enough games to keep their draft pick at number seven, which allowed them to take Harrison Barnes, then Draymond Green, then Festus Azili. Um, sad to say, it definitely happens a lot in the NBA. I would almost like to call it gamesmanship in the modern era, but there's, there's no masking what it is. I mean, you are trying to deceive the general public and rest your players in order to lose games. But I don't. Th- I, I think NBA is much worse at that than like in the NHL. You don't see teams sitting star players to tank. You see them sitting like you'll see the odd time guy. They'll give a guy just like not and again not as frequently as they'll do in the NBA. But that you'll see him see guys maybe not play as much. Or a goalie take a night, a couple nights off because they've already locked up their playoff spot. They can't move up or down. And so we're gonna rest. We're gonna rest you. Get you, make sure you're fresh for the playoffs. To me, that's not even in the same conversation as tanking or game. Let's just. It's just smart, right? Yeah. Like, but I, I can't think of a time where I where I remember a team like. Again, I I just came out of an era where the Leafs were terrible. It wasn't because they were sitting anybody that was good. <laughs> now they openly like no like they 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 pro like they're the best model of tanking because they just said you know what we're just going to be so bad and if we if we see even a sliver of talent we're going to trade you because we don't want you to be on our team except for a couple of core players but we're going to trade everybody else and we're just going to be so miserable that no one's going to blame us for tanking in the sense of cheating but we're just going to get as many assets as possible and build up which i think is I think is smart. I would much rather that than like the like the Vancouver Canucks right now. They're trying to tank, but then they're going out and signing veterans to to like long term deals to try and appease their fans. Well, you're never gonna get you're never gonna be bad enough, but you're also never gonna be good enough. But in the NBA, it definitely has taken a different different approach. So I don't know if you can hear, but. There's someone in my house that is not happy about this conversation either. And he is making it very well known about that. Yeah. Young Hank does not approve of tanking in any form. No. He is a true sportsman. Yeah, so. Well, Mr. Mr. Mike, that's all well, I got. Joel, where can our listeners find us? Well, they can find us on Pinterest at the Fourth Line Podcast. They can find us on uh, um, our MySpace page. Um, this topic. Yeah. Um, I don't. We're not entirely sure where this segment is going to air, but uh, at the very least, it's going to be um, after dark uh, on the fourth line, the after dark fourth line special or something like that. We'll come up. We'll put a. We we'll got SoundCloud thing. Oh, SoundCloud doesn't exist anymore, does it? I don't know where it is. Um, but you can actually find us at the fourth line podcast.com and also at the line podcast on Twitter. Yeah. You go to those two places. You'll be able to find us where you want to just search Think. the fourth line podcast, something like that. We're not as good as Carl. Don't expect us to be as good as Carl. Speak for yourself. Thanks as always to our Patreon support and everybody who's listening at home on behalf of the fourth line. This is tiny and there's Joel. Boom city.